Hello, and welcome to Ralph Reads, brought to you by T-U-R-N, the United Ronin Networks. My name is Ralph Anthony Garcia, also known as R4, the legal, the loyal, the regal, the royal Ronin Ralph, your master of ceremonies. Please like, share, comment, and subscribe. Tell a friend to tell a friend to tune in to T-U-R-N, the United Ronin Networks. We are Ronin. On today's edition of Ralph Reads, I reintroduce the mastery of Sister Soldier and her next novel, which is to be the prequel to her first entitled Midnight, a gangster love story. This is a First Pocket Star Books paperback edition, September 2010, copyrighted 2008 by Soldier Story Incorporated. Let the reading commence. Dedication To powerful minds, deep voices, and long legs. To committed hearts, fierce fighters, and passionate lovers. To men who bow their heads, read their books, raise their fists, handle their business, and never abandon their families. To beautiful men who still have the glow of God in their eyes. By Sister Soldier. Acknowledgements. A special thanks to every brother worldwide who ever had a meaningful conversation with me. A heartfelt thanks to every brother who ever taught me a lesson or shared a perspective that I did not already know or consider. A warm thanks to all the brothers who show me both love and respect at the same time. A resounding thanks to every brother who ever considered my words, thoughts, and feelings and used them to make a positive and powerful change in their own lives. A revolutionary thanks to every brother who ever stood by my side back and front in difficult times. The ones who did not run and hide when my voice hit the target, or my words seared the soul, or my truth made things too damn clear. Warm appreciation to the more than one million females who have read, digested, understood, and reflected on my words. Thank you for buying all my books, passing them around, and using them to become better than what we are expected to be. Peace. Cornell, Osman, Saadi, Esau, Kerry, Mahmoud, Glenn, Guyfrey, Tim, Devacious, Shamin, Bilal, Eric, Steve, David, Hack, Drew, Jeffrey, Malachi, Maurice, Tony, Jeff, Sam, Bird, Mr. Miles, John Desane, and Charlie Mack. Special thanks to Bill Stephanie, Lindsey Williams, Vernon Rudd, Kenny Gamble, Ross Baraka, Mandla Kais, Dougie Fresh, Chuck D, Will Smith, Craig Hodges, Chris Weber, Bill Perkins, Esquire, C. Vernon Mason, Esquire, Alton Maddox, Esquire, Michael Warren, Esquire, Lennox Hines, Esquire, Dr. Leonard Jeffries, Reverend Dr. Calvin Butts, Reverend Dr. Ben Chavis, Reverend Dr. William Howard, Minister Louis Farrakhan, Bob Law, Gil Noble, Reverend Jesse Lewis Jackson, Governor David Patterson, Tupac Shakur, KRS-One, LL Cool J, Ice Cube, Wise Intelligent, Tragedy, Kane, to the one-of-a-kind Sean Puffy Puff Daddy Diddy P. Diddy Combs, a professional thanks to Emily Bestler, who welcomed me in, treated me properly, and worked through the awesome process. Also to the publishing boss, Judith Kerr. A very special thanks to Yuki Morita, Sensei Mariko, and Mu. Thanks to Steve Wazerman and Bob Shear. Big up to Brooklyn. Thank you to Mitsua, Edgewater, New Jersey, and Pingman Tai, Emerson, New Jersey. Sisterly thanks to Dr. Monica Martin, Gervon Rice, Lisa Sweet, Wafa Abdallah, and Kenya Woods. A loving thank you to my husband and son, as always and forever. All praise is due to God. I thank God for my life and breath, my purpose, and for inspiration, imagination, protection, and prosperity. Peace. Chapter 1 I am not who you think I am. If you love me, you love me for the wrong reasons. Females tell me they love me because I'm tall. 
They love when I stand over them and look down. They love when I lay them down and my height and body weight dominates them. Females tell me they love me because I'm pure black. They say they never seen a black man so masculine, so pretty, so beautiful before. Females say they love my eyes. They're jet black too. Women claim they find a passion in them so forceful that they'll do anything I say. Females tell me they love my body. They beg me for a hug even when there's nothing between me and them. They want to be captured in my embrace and press their breasts against my chest. Some females ask if they can just touch me. Some tremble when my hands touch them. They say they love the muscles in my arms. They surrender when I lift them up. They whine and moan in rapture. Some cry their pleasure. Some shake. Some of them even say they love the way my teeth look in my mouth and how my feet look in my kicks. Females tell me they love the way I talk, like I'm soon to own the world. Most females say they love that I'm quiet, then shiver when I finally talk. All of the women show me that they love my guns. The fact that I walk with two of them at times. Even the ones who get scared fall in love with their fear of me. Then they come at me even harder. Some females say I'm too serious. Then shield their eyes to hide their feelings from shine when I finally smile. I can't lie. I enjoy the good times that some of these women offer me but I don't take them to heart. I know that they don't really even know me. All the sh** that they are in love with is just my style and my looks, all window dressing. I know that a man is his own beliefs, his own ideas and actions. If you knew me, you would know what I believe. If you knew what I believe, then you would understand how I think. You will understand my ideas and actions. Only then should you decide either you believe what I believe or you admire what I believe and want to get with those beliefs. If not, in the long run, we got nothing in common. I can't take you seriously. I gotta go. You got nothing that makes me want to stay. I don't come from where you come from. I don't think like you do. My whole situation is different. I come from a country of real men who take real life real serious. I wouldn't trade places with an American-born man for any amount of cash. Where I'm from, a son has a first name and three last names. The three last names are the names of his father, grandfather, and great-grandfather. Any male who cannot identify his father, grandfather, and great-grandfather is already lost. These three names are what makes a boy who he is. There is no talk of role models and celebrities. A son is raised under his father's wing with a grandfather to guide and a great-grandfather as a blueprint, plus an army of uncles nearby. Where I'm from, a man does not bow to any other man. A man bows only to Allah. Only Allah created the heavens, the galaxies, the universe, and all of the millions of creatures within. My father had three wives, not one wife, one wifey, and a bunch of random bitches on the side. Where I'm from, a man wants to marry a woman and establish a strong family. A man can have more than one wife as long as he can treat them all fairly and provide them with love, separate homes, food, guidance, and presence. There is no such thing as domestic drama. A woman feels fortunate to be selected by a quality husband, a family man, who will be by her side for her entire lifetime. Families are permanent. When a man is ready to build with his family, he selects a woman who he likes, who is from a family who raised her right, a woman who knows how to love and live. She has to be good for him, his beliefs and plans for life. Someone who brings him peace, progress, and pleasure. Then he is down for her, for real. 
She is down for him too because she feels his strength, craves his love and attention, feels safe tucked at his side and is confident that every day he is making the right moves for her, his family and himself. Our women don't, don't agree with her man. A man knows what he's supposed to do and not do. It is the same thing he watched his own father do and not do, so he does it. Even if a man selects the wrong path, his punishment is between himself and a lot. This woman cannot punish him, judge him, or nag him to death. In my country, a wife is not a whole or ex whole. Every move a woman makes matters. She can bring dishonor to her man and family even with a simple glance at another man if it is held for too long. Even where I am from, there are whores. They know their place too. They stay within the walls of the illegal whore house, never to be glorified, honored, claimed, or married. A whore, where I'm from, is the opposite of arrogant. She is used but never celebrated by decent men or women. She knows that she can never enjoy the lifestyle and contentment of a respected sister, daughter, mother, or wife. The punishment for a good woman who comes from a good family and suddenly behaves horrish is severe. She will be isolated by her parents, family, and friends. Her father and mother may lock her away and confine her to one room in the house. In some cases, she is even murdered by her own husband, father, or brother for bringing shame and dishonor to her family and the people who raised, guided, loved, and provided for her. The family member who commits the murder is not arrested. The whole country acknowledges that a woman is sacred. Every move she makes is either building her family up or breaking it down. Every thought she has is felt and considered by her children. Every word she speaks either teaches or misleads. She must remain honorable, pure, and righteous. Otherwise, there will be no happiness, no family, and no reason to exist. Mouthing off, f***ing her man's friends, brothers, and cousins, running away with the children, aborting the babies, lying about who is the father of her children, not knowing who the father is, yelling and disrespecting, doing drugs, drinking, parading around mostly naked, acting crazy. Our men don't stand for that. We have not experienced that. We never will. Our women know their place. They stay in it and live and thrive there. They remain there happily. Our women give love and are loved even more. She is respected, protected, and provided for. She lives proud and at peace. Where I am from, liquor is legal and forbidden. We believe that it makes a man behave with ignorance. After drinking liquor, the next step we believe is to betray God and destroy yourself and your family. In my country, is non-existent. For the absolute majority, it is unknown and undone. There have been one or two of those who have traveled out to other places in Europe or America and come back with this bizarre behavior. However, they could never remain with us. Their hilaushesum resulted in suicides, or they just turned up missing. There are no tears for the man who and builds a life where there can be no balance, reproduction, or family. Where I am from, adultery is a crime for a man or a woman. Even to someone else's sister or daughter just because you feel like it or like the way she looks without approaching her family for marriage means that you have brought about a battle between dishonored families yours and hers the man who commits adultery will be punished by his family the woman who commits adultery will be considered ruined where i am from men work whether he works his own land and is paid in the foods the earth produces, whether he works someone else's land, whether he is paid in cash, cattle, or otherwise, he works. 
Hard work is a man's way of providing for and demonstrating that he loves his family. Each man must have a business of products or services. His product might be fish, meats, vegetables, fruits, jewelry, clothing, crafts, furniture, vehicles, parts, and supplies, or other items. Or he may provide services as a doctor, carpenter, construction worker, engineer, lawyer, driver, educator, or performer. But no man can sit doing nothing. His family, backed up by the entire community, would never allow it. When I talk about where I'm from, which is almost never, both males and females feel uneasy. Some look at me in disbelief, like I'm a fucking liar. Others stare off in complete boredom, like it is not a life they would ever want to live. But I feel fine. People where I'm from are happy, while almost everybody I know in America feels fucked up, empty, and dissatisfied, especially the black people. At 14 years young, I became a citizen of the United States. It was supposed to be a great day, to be remembered for a lifetime. There we were, becoming a part of what is known as the best country in the world, America. After having been born and living inside of what Americans consider the worst place in the world, the continent of Africa. We got dressed up and took the A train to City Hall in New York City. We recited some things that we had already memorized. Then it became official. I should say it became legal. I was an American on paper. I never became one in my heart or mind. The year I became an American was the same year I got locked up. I went from the projects to juvenile detention to prison. Each year I became more and more familiar with the American blacks. The ones who looked just like me. They range from very light skin to my rich dark color as it is back home. When I first arrived, there were Afro-Americans, then blacks, then African-Americans, and eventually n****s. They talked like they were the most powerful, clever motherfuckers on the planet. They looked down on other blacks arriving from any other country in the world. They hated every accent besides their own. They was quick to catch an attitude and say some shit that I could tell they really knew nothing about. There was no real way for me to separate myself from them. We all looked the same, wore the same clothes, spoke the same slang, all united by our Air Jordans. I don't talk a lot. Where I'm from, the boys and men are trained to leave the blabbering to young girls. It wasn't too long before I realized that if I said nothing for the rest of my life, shit would only get worse. I'm telling my story so black people worldwide will know that we wasn't always fucked up. Also, that a good life takes great effort and sacrifice, but feels so much better than what we all got now. Besides, if the authentic men don't say shit, there will be no evidence that real men really do exist. Living side by side with n****s and watching them play themselves every second of every day, the broke ones all the way up to the rich ones, is killing me. I'm not a preacher, politician, pimp, or celebrity. Most of them couldn't go to hell quick enough for me. A man who doesn't say what he means or do what he says craves attention and misuses it when he gets it, doesn't share what he knows and earns, deserves death. I am not who you think I am. My people are not who you think they are. Our culture and traditions are unknown to you. Sometimes it takes someone from the outside to show you how you look and do. If you're American born and raised, you're bound to get it twisted. You can't see yourselves or don't know yourselves. You're too accustomed to looking at life from only one f***ed up angle. Everything you have ever seen or heard about Africa is wrong. My African grandfather taught me that the storyteller is the most powerful person in the world after God. My grandfather said, be careful who you listen to and what they are saying. 
The storyteller is clever and masterful and has already decided exactly what he wants you to think and believe. The storyteller has the power to make people feel good or bad about themselves. The storyteller has the power to make people feel strong or weak, ugly or beautiful, confident or defeated. Unfortunately, all of the stories being told to blacks in America, Europe, Africa, and the Caribbean have made blacks worldwide feel low, weak, crazy, backward, and powerless. So low that the storyteller has set the conditions for blacks to be robbed of all of their stuff and too stupid to recognize it. So put your bruise and blunts on pause. Rock with me for a few. Chapter 2 African born, my father was not a king, but he was a phenomenon. The things he taught and showed me were more valuable than the three sparkling three carat diamonds he placed in the palm of my hand. My father said, not every man is qualified to be king. Not every man should want to be king. When unqualified men become king, they destroy everyone one way or another because of their ignorance, greed, or anger. Every day they live with the fear that it will be exposed that they do not deserve their wealth and do not really know how to rule. My father was the advisor to the prime minister of the Sudan, the most powerful man in our country. He was also the advisor to an extremely popular and influential southern Sudanese king. My father was a great thinker, the man with the ideas that the king and prime minister pretended they thought of themselves. This placed my father in a position of power, quiet power, but it also put him in a position of working to bring two deeply separated parts of one nation together. He was constantly being studied and watched and eventually hated by a handful of men who could not compare. These same men who couldn't think or see straight on their own had no vision of the power that would come through unity. They envied my father, rejected his thoughts and ideas, yet imitated his style and finesse. When crooked men feel threatened and have no chance of competing with or matching the intelligence and maneuvers of a man who they see as their rival, they begin to use their insecurity to set that man up and bear false witness against him. They don't stop until they bring him down, drive him out, and eliminate him from holding on to something they could never have achieved fair and square. My father taught me to lay low. Don't be the horse I wants to be seen and celebrated all day, every day. Be cool. Take it easy. Carry out your plans in life, slow and steady. Push hard. My father pushed hard, loved hard, lived hard, making great use of every minute and moment. A scientist, he graduated from the University of Khartoum at age 20. He earned his master's degree at the Sorbonne University in Paris, France. He completed his Ph.D. at Columbia University in the USA. At age 26, he returned home a doctor of science. He reminded everyone that Africa was the best place in the world. He didn't just say it. He meant it. He moved back in and worked the land and built businesses from scratch to empire status. My father was six foot eight and pure black from head to toe. A blessing, not a curse. An international man, he saw the whole world as his backyard. He made our home in northern Sudan, the place where my mother was born and raised, the place where I was born also. We lived on his estate, 75 acres of land, four houses, eight buildings, and all of the property I could see in every direction was ours. He named our estate Beit El Rahim, which means the womb. He said he chose this name for many reasons. One, he said, because Africa is the birthplace of the world, of human beings, of intelligence, and of all of the prophets. Two, he said, because women are the key to life. Three, he said, because children born of a healthy womb become the guardians of traditions 
and children born of an unhealthy womb become the curse. So the womb itself is sacred. If we choose, we never had to leave our property. Most of my family lived there. My father's closest friends and co-workers' children went to our school on our property and prayed at the mosque on our property. My mother's businesses was located there in a fully equipped building, exclusively used, managed, and populated by women. Our food was grown on our land. We drew our water from our fresh water wells. Our place was filled with love, laughter, prayer, and music. My father purchased the finest clothes, most handmade in the Sudan, the rest imported from Italy, France, and America, and customized to his size and fit. His shoes were imported from Milan, Lisbon, Gueru, Seoul, and Canberra, but his favorite pair was made by his own father, my southern grandfather, who made the shoes from scratch right before my father's eyes. He gave them to him as a parting gift when my father went off to college explaining that the handmade pair of shoes were the sturdiest and most reliable, the same as his southern village. My grandfather said those shoes would bring his son home to him where southern grandfather believed he belonged. My father loved and collected music from around the world. Some evenings we grooved and listened to the thoughtful and melodic voice of Bob Marley. Stevie Wonder's lyrics painted pictures in our minds. Miriam Makiba sang us messages from the people of South Africa. Fela rocked us from Nigeria. The young voice of Michael Jackson amazed and excited us. Our homegrown Sudanese singers like Abdallah Amiago sang us familiar songs framed by familiar sounds, waking and reawaking our love of life and Allah. In one of the buildings on our property reserved for men, my father sometimes practiced playing his trumpet. Once a month, he performed with his Just For Fun band before an audience of family and close friends. He taught me that hard-working men must always find ways to relax and enjoy life without destroying their family relationships. He spoke seven languages and had acquaintances throughout the world. My father taught me that language should never separate one good person from another. Any man can learn another man's language if he can shut up long enough to listen and sit still long enough to study. We spoke Arabic at home, but he made sure I could speak at least the greetings of several African tongues, and I also studied English in school and practiced speaking it along with my schoolmates. My mother only spoke Arabic. My father loved her so much that she was the exception of many of his rules. He laid the world at her feet. When he hugged and kissed her, anyone could tell there was nothing realer than that. Even I could tell he wanted her only to himself. I'd move out of their way and disappear into one of the many rooms of our home. He surrounded her in his love, but still allowed her to have her friends, business, and life within the places built exclusively for her behind the walls of the womb. He was never shy about expressing himself to her. I saw it all the time. About her, I felt the same way. When my father did business in the surrounding suburbs and villages he drove, he mostly drove his truck. My father had guns galore. Real ones, from 22s to 45s to 357s to 9s to Glocks to G3 rifles to semi-automatics, Uzis, and AK-47s. There were so many weapons that he had a small brick fort built on our property just to store them. On my fifth birthday, he gave me a key to his fort. It was one of the many tests he gave me to prepare for life. He often would challenge me, asking, Where is your key? I'd better have it on me, not in the pocket of the pants I wore last week or yesterday, not somewhere that I couldn't remember or in the possession of one of the house cleaners or my mother even. He taught me that I had to be responsible for my stuff instead of shifting my weight onto any other person. He taught me how to hold each of the weapons. I felt that most of them weighed more than me. He assured me that they didn't. He taught me how to take them apart, put them back together, and how to clean and load them. 
The first time he took me to target practice, I was five years old. The kickback from the gun in my hand lifted me off of my feet and threw me to the ground. Within seconds, he had me stand back up on my feet and begin firing once again. If you fear the gun, he said, you will never be calm enough to hit your target. My father was not a military man, but when I got the chance to travel outside of our estate with him on business or pleasure, he made sure he pointed out Egyptian-made aircraft flying through our skies, German-made watercraft sailing on our waters, Soviet T-54 tanks and MiG-17s surface-to-air missiles and more. Slowly and carefully, he would say so seriously, this one was designed by Germany, this one was designed by Britain, this one was designed by Israel, this one was designed by Italy, this one was designed by Pakistan. All of these weapons in this section were manufactured by the Americans, he would say, pointing. Do you know why they designed and provided these weapons for us, he would ask me. Do you know what they want you to do with them, he would ask. Then he would answer himself. They designed these weapons so that we could make their lives easier. So that you and I would wipe out our own family, friends, and countrymen. Allowing them, the foreigners, to come in and raid and rule our land, seize our gold, export our diamonds, and siphon our oils. Take a look around, he would say. Everything we have, some which I acquired through birthright, the rest from hard work, education, blood, sweat, and tears could be gone in an instant because it is everything that every man in the world dreams of possessing. You must fight to keep it. My father said every son is entitled to inherit what his father earned, but still must plan to fight for it. Admire your father, but still become a man who stands on his own feet and works his own accomplishments and miracles. My father said, Every man will be pushed to kill something or someone, either to feed himself and his family or to keep from being disrespected and dominated. But don't be eager to kill, son, because when you kill, you lose something too. It is better to give life than to give death. It is harder to maintain life than it is to wipe it out. There are unreasonable men on this earth who are determined not to let you be as you are, live as you are, love as you are, work as you are. They will bring war to your doorstep, like it or not. If you win, good for you and your family. Praise Allah. Enjoy the peace. If you lose, lay low. Go underground, go slow, rebuild and regroup and come again. If they take your land, gold, diamonds and oils, let them have it for the moment while you think, repositioning yourself, regain your strength, plan and purpose. But never allow them to take your women, your children or your family or you will be defeated forever. My father said and did a whole lot of incredible things. His voice is louder in my ear than my own. He taught me that women are 100% emotion. Love them, but don't obey them. A man must go into the world without fear and do what is right, required, and necessary. The last thing he told me the last time I saw him was, Son, no matter what. Take care of your mother and your sister. Guard them and their honor. Protect them with your life. My family came to America, not because we loved it and thought it was a better place and a land of opportunity. We came to America without our influence and abundant riches. To lay low, to go underground, to go slow, to rebuild, to regroup, to regain our strength position, plan, and purpose to come again. Chapter 3 
my beautiful mother and I arrived in the U.S. on October 31st, 1979. I was seven years young. When we were greeted by three American customs officers who were all wearing pink pig snouts and pink pig ears, we had never heard of Halloween. We don't celebrate the devil in our country. I gripped my mother's hand and heard my father's voice in my mind. Son, there are unreasonable men on this earth. I watched closely as the officers searched through our few things. I was confident that they would not discover my three carat diamonds in our hollowed out sole of my right shoe. Three wishes, my father called the diamonds when he dropped them into my palm. Three wishes when everything and everyone else around you fails or when you feel trapped. If you never have the need to use them, then don't. Pass them along to your son and him to his son. One of the officers seemed to have a problem with me watching him. He asked me, What's the matter, kid? No one ever told you the story of the three pigs? My 26 years young mother... A five-foot-seven, golden-skinned, Arabic-speaking, lean, shapely, and beautiful African woman with big, dark eyes and a dimple in her chin was wrapped up from head to toe as Islamic women do. She peeked through her veil and looked down at me for an understanding, a translation of the customs officer's English. I looked back up to her and said in Arabic, It's a silly game they're playing. How old is the boy? One officer asked my mother. I answered, Seven. The three of them shot looks at each other and snickered. Hey, Johnny, have you ever seen a seven-year-old kid this size in your son's second-grade class? What the hell were they feeding you? He asked, looking toward me with coffee-stained teeth and a crooked smile. I didn't say nothing in my response to his stupid comments. I was more than half of his short size. I figured that was his problem. Remove the veil and headscarf, the American customs officers demanded. This order was considered an offense, an insult to us. Where we come from, a woman is never asked to reveal herself in the presence of any man who is not her father, husband, brother, or son. I looked at their weapons hanging on their hips. One officer's eyes followed mine as I checked out the mirrors in the corners of the ceiling. The cameras aimed down at us, so I translated to my mother. She removed the hijab and niqab very reluctantly, hearing the authority in the tone of their foreign voices and feeling the threat of the moment. The customs men watched every move of her hands, scanning and admiring the unfamiliar and beautifully drawn henna designs she wore on each of her fingers and on the palms of her hands. Her thick, long, and pretty brown hair, now uncovered, dropped down to her back. Immediately, they reacted to her revealed beauty with gasps, long, lusty stares, and three dirty smirks. She kept her gaze on the floor and asked me in Arabic if they were finished. I asked them in English, Are you finished? Still smiling, one of the officers nodded. The other waved his hand and said, Yeah, head to the next line over there. I checked them watching her so closely as she wrapped back into her hijab and reattached her niqab to cover her face all but her eyes. We walked away. I heard one of them say to the other, Wow, I'd like to get my hands on something exotic like that. They laughed. The other officer said, Funny, I wasn't thinking about my hands, man. I thought to myself, first thing I'm getting is a gun. Chapter 4 There was nothing wrong with the building, the block, or the sky above. It was the motherfuckers living in there who had to be closely watched. When we moved in, the first thing on me that got attacked was my clothes. An older guy named Daquan, who seemed to be in charge of the bench outside of the building door, called me over to his office. I had to walk by the bench to get off the block anyway. I was seven. 
This cat was about 16. Instead of gold fronts, Daquan had two sturdy silver teeth. I saw him rocking his clothes with the price tag still hanging on them, dangling from his fitted hat or hanging from his kicks or plastered across his pants pockets. Most of his sh** was labeled Polo, Ralph Lauren, or Nike. His kicks kept changing up daily. You can't come outside like that no more. You fucking up the whole look of the building, he told me with a screw face. I just stood there, looking back at him for some seconds. I was just learning how to translate the black version of English and their slang. What is it that you're talking about? I asked him. Immediately, he started laughing at my accent, my way of talking. All this sh** got to go, he said, using his Dutch to point out everything I was wearing, from the kofi on my head down to my shoes. Around here, we wear fitted. Put a brim on your hat, my man, and throw them joints in the trash right now. You insulting me, he said, looking down at my feet. He got off his bench and pulled his metal trash can, which was chained to the bottom of his bench, closer to me. I didn't move. He tried to grab my shoes right off my feet. I jumped back and pulled out my knife. He laughed and said, what the f*** you gonna do with that? I walked away, past him and the bench, and off the block to do what I was doing. The next day, he was on the bench with two other boys when I came walking by. Little man, let me build with you for a minute, he said. I had no choice but to pass by him. I'm a big man, so I won't fight you. I'll give you one last warning about this fish you keep wearing. Get rid of it. If you need work, I'll put you on. But if you come outside one more time with this f***ed up fashion, I'ma put my young brother Deshaun on your ass. No knives, just a fair one, fist to fist every day until you get it right. His brother Deshaun had on Levi's jeans, no shirt, and a matching jean jacket with some new kicks. He grimaced at me, something I guess his brother taught him to do. I looked straight back at him. I got five brothers. Deshaun here is nine. Dayron is ten. You could take your pick. I'll bring them all downstairs and line them up for you. But every day, you're gonna have to fight one of them either way. I could tell, he couldn't tell, or maybe he didn't care, that I was only seven. We can fight, I answered him with no emotion. He tried to stay straight-faced, but I could tell he was surprised. I fought one of his brothers every day for two weeks. Whoever was on the block at the time took it as entertainment, but Daquan could see that I took it seriously. Slowly, he learned to show me a little respect. Everybody noticed how I never tried to duck out the side or the back of the building. I showed up ready with no fear. I fought the nine-year-old for the first few days. Everybody could see I had more skill. He would start out strong in the beginning, but couldn't make it through to the finish. But Daquan would have him right out there the next day to try again. Next, I took on Dayron, the ten-year-old who had more weight than me. But my father once taught me a way to fight someone who was bigger and stronger. While we was battling, their big brother Daquan would stand over us yelling at his brother to do this or that, to move this way or that way. When he would see that one of his brothers was losing, he would start threatening them right there on the spot. You better whip his ass or I'ma whip your ass. Get your fist up. Take him down. Take him down. Or you're gonna have to fight me next. He would threaten them. On my last fight with the ten-year-old, Daquan screamed on him so hard I actually felt sorry for him. When it became clear that I had defeated him too. Daquan made him strip out of his clothes and snatched off his new sneakers. I gave the kid credit for standing out there in broad daylight in his boxes. He gave in to his brother's orders and didn't cry at his humiliation. Always there would be a small crowd watching. Day by day, it increased in size. Daquan did not know he was doing me a favor. He introduced me to the hood as a fighter. A young one with exceptional stamina who never backed down. It helped my reputation a lot and put some of the young wannabes around our way on pause. The 11-year-old named De Leon posed a problem for me, I thought. 
The first time I faced him to fight, I figured he must be feeling real powerful surrounded by his two younger brothers seated right there on the bench and his older brother Daquan standing right next to him and on point. Aside from the three of them, his 13-year-old brother, who never sat down, was always leaned up against the bench, never saying one word or ever cracking a smile. He stared me in my eyes the entire time. He seemed more foul than the other five and was a threat to me of what was coming up next if I dared to take his 11-year-old brother down. He was six years older than me and too big. He looked like a f***ing cheater, a dirty fighter. So my strategy was to go hard at the 11-year-old, forcing Daquan to give me my props, declare me the winner, and to call it all off. Instead of getting right down to it, we walked around in circles first, staring each other down. He was slightly taller than me. The crowd was shouting out random sh**. Somebody said something funny. In the split second that he looked away to chase the joke, I smashed his face with my right fist. His nose started bleeding. He was in the fighting stands now, looking angry and determined. Still, he was making the mistake of having his eyes in the wrong place, watching his blood drops splatter in small circles on the cement. Keep your eyes on his fists, Daquan yelled at him. The kid got amped up and took a swing at me. I ducked. He missed. I landed a big bare-fisted punch in his stomach and he doubled over. Stand the f*** up! Stand the f*** up! Daquan yelled. I gave him time to straighten up before I punched him in his face again. His eyes turned red and mucus gushed out of one nostril mixing with his blood. Suddenly his chest started heaving, tears started to form in his eyes. His two younger brothers were on their feet now, trying to stop the fight. Daquan pushed them both out of the way, leaned over, and started screaming face to face on his 11-year-old brother. Oh, you're gonna stand there and catch a f***ing asthma attack before you lose in the fight? That sh** ain't gonna help you win! Cut that sh** out! He hollered at his brother, who could not seem to catch his breath. He needs his pump! The nine-year-old screamed. He ain't getting no pump! Daquan silenced him. I'll go and get it, his ten-year-old brother said, then ran. But the thirteen-year-old brother caught him by the neck of his jacket and held him right there. Now calm down and take all your sh** off and give it to him. You don't deserve to have nothing, Daquan ordered the eleven-year-old. The boy's breathing got worse. His fingers fiddled nervously with his belt. I don't want them, I said. Those are his clothes. He can keep them. I walked away. I had sh** to take care of, and after fighting today, nothing on me was dirty. I wasn't bleeding. My clothes weren't ripped or split. There was no reason for me to go back upstairs. When I got back home, there was a plastic shopping bag against my apartment door. I looked inside. There was a fresh pair of jeans folded with the tags on, a t-shirt and a crisp fitted. The kicks gave away the sender. They were the brand new ones like the pair the 11-year-old wore for the fight. I took the delivery three different ways. One was that Daquan wanted me to know he didn't have no problem finding out where my apartment was and who my family was and he would come up to our place whenever I was at home or not. Two, that Daquan was admitting the embarrassing defeat of his 11-year-old brother. Three, that maybe the 13-year-old didn't want to fight me next. I took the shopping bag as a message to me, half threat. Half reward. I thought about it for two seconds, grabbed the bag, and shot down the stairs to Daquan's apartment. I wanted him to understand that I knew he was watching me, but I was watching him too. He could come up to my apartment, and I could come down to his just as easy. Before I could bang on the door, Daquan pulled it open. He had on new jeans and sneakers as usual. But this time, he wasn't wearing a shirt, and his 9mm was gleaming, tucked at his waist. What do you want? Daquan asked. I handed him back a shopping bag, but couldn't take my gaze off his gun. One of those, I answered with a nod towards his piece. Daquan smiled. Come on in, kid, he said. 
All five of Daquan's brothers were in one back room. There was Deshaun, Dayron, DeLeon, and a 13-year-old. I didn't know his name. This was the first time seeing the 15-year-old who was almost as tall as Daquan. I found out his name was Damon. Each of them was sitting on one of two beds. Only the 11-year-old with the asthma was sitting on top of his hands and had his head hanging down. Get your f***ing head up, Daquan barked. And keep it the f*** up, he added. Meanwhile, the 13-year-old, still standing, stared me down with hatred. I was wrong for thinking that he didn't want to fight me next. Even though he was almost twice my age, he looked like he wanted a crack at crashing my skull. Deshaun, the ten-year-old brother, turned away when he noticed it was me and looked out the window instead. Look this man in his eyes, Daquan bossed him. Now all six of them were staring, focused on me. Daquan had a wall no one could see because, from the ceiling to the floor, it was covered by crisp sneaker boxes of all kinds. They were perfectly stacked, like in a small store. Damon, give me box number 77, he told his 15-year-old brother. The brother hesitated at first, then he sped up and pulled the box out for him. Daquan took the box from his brother and told me to follow him down the hall. In the dark corridor of their apartment, Daquan squatted down to speak confidently. He opened the top of the sneaker box, revealing two guns sparkling on top of white tissue paper. I could see one was a twenty-two, the other was a nine. Aye, little man, from now on you're gonna work for me, he said, but I cut him off. No! When I saw the anger moving into his face, I corrected myself. No thanks, I said. How much is it? These cannons are big boy toys, he said, raising up from his squat like he was reluctant or now refusing to sell it to me. I waited silently for him to quote the price. He's a businessman, I thought to myself. If he was any good at it, it was his job to move his product. He felt my point. It's three fifty for the nine, two hundred for the twenty-two, bullets included, he told me. Cool and confident that he had outpriced me and trapped me in his employ. I put my hands in my pockets and peeled off five hundred and fifty dollars. I'll take both of them, I said, pointing toward the weapons. For the first time ever, I saw him actually hesitate. His eyes stayed on my small money stack. Aye, right, little man, but you're going to have to learn to work with other people for real. I can sell you the pieces. That's what I do but I cannot let you walk around in those f***ed up clothes. I'll sell to you if you change into the clothes in this shopping bag. It's a compromise, he said, staring at me in the form of a threat. I looked at him and thought to myself, this fashion sh must be their American religion. Then I thought again, protecting my mother, Uma, is my religion, so I accepted. Deal. He took the money. I took the bag and the sneaker box and started to leave. Show and prove, Daquan demanded, but I didn't understand. Put them on now, he ordered. He seemed used to giving orders and having them followed. And let me tell you this, little man, this is Brooklyn. No matter if it turns 200 degrees in the summertime, we don't rock sandals. No man sandals, you got it? He said. If I ever seen wearing those sandals again, you're finished, he threatened with his most serious tone yet and pointed his trigger finger to the head. That was my official introduction to NYC. That's how I came up on my first two guns. That's how I got introduced to New York fashion and styles. Leave all that f***ed up shit you had on right there, he stood over me. I laid my kufi, my linen pants, my white silk Islamic shirt, and my sandals to rest. These were all high-quality, respectable clothes made from the finest materials. Where I am from, jeans are considered casual clothes used when laboring, doing construction, working on the land, repairing the house, or maintaining the vehicles. But in Brooklyn... My African dress clothes made me a target and I was prepared to turn my situation around and do what I needed to do to protect my family. I never rocked another pair of sandals. 
Word of mouth in Brooklyn was as powerful as the call to prayer back home. Word of mouth in Brooklyn was even more influential than the talking drum beat in my southern grandfather's village. So in 24 hours, the whole building knew I, the young fearless one, was backing. A few days later, after I copped, I saw my old sandals dangling from the telephone wires that ran from pole to pole way up high throughout the hood. I didn't flinch. It was a symbol, a reminder to me of where I was and who I had to be to hold my position. Chapter 5 There is no place for fear in a man. There is no place for fear in a ghetto. I consider myself to be at war with every single n I ran into. The big ones and the small ones. So I stay fit and strapped. It was no either or situation for me. In my room, I pushed my bed up against the wall and into the corner. I needed the floor space. I did my push-ups, sit-ups, and pull-ups like it was part of my religion. In the hood, I noticed a lot of out-of-shape types, either too damn skinny or too damn fat. Instead, they hid behind the barrels of their guns. My father taught me that it is always better to have a choice of weapons. So I trained my body, my hands, and my feet to be my weapons too. Seven days a week in our apartment, I did my unofficial training. In the Brooklyn Ninjutsu School, I did my official training. My teacher, whose students called Sensei, was a 30-something-year-old Japanese man who owned a nice-sized space that we called the dojo. It wasn't a cramped storefront that had different kids dropping in and out all the time. It was a large, spacious, four-room facility. We were trained to fight in the largest room. We had lockers in the locker room. Private lessons were offered in the smaller back room. Sensei had his own office to chill in. The walls were lined with photographs of real fighters in wicked stances, some even flying in the air. The expressions on their faces revealed their killer instinct as though the photos had just been snapped seconds before their opponent's defeat. The students were all handpicked and selected to train by Sensei. Some people's money he turned away easily. He wanted youth who were serious about fighting and defending something based on a real principle and not just for the hell of it. He kept sharp rules on attendance and honor. He never screamed and never joked either. Sensei told us stories of ancient men who constantly had to fight to defend themselves and their families against individuals, corrupt armies, and governments. He demonstrated how they used everything they had to make weapons and went up against their enemies even though they were completely outnumbered and favored to lose. I considered my situation to be just like that. Coming from a foreign land, I did not trust the United States authorities. I didn't even trust the American people. Even when I came across those born and raised in the U.S. who introduced themselves as Muslims, I took them for jokers. They were going nowhere fast, aging right before my eyes, bent over, scratching, and thoughtless. I seen a few of them when we moved in. At first, I thought they were poor people. Even back in the Sudan, there are poor people. I soon found out and understood their condition. It wasn't that they were poor. A poor man can fight and have a chance of winning. A poor man can earn and build and become victorious. A fiend is just a f***ed up zombie, half-dead loser. Close to the bottom were schoolboys. They came home from school every afternoon just like they were told. They were no real threat to me. I kept my eye on them anyway. It wasn't long before I peeped their style. Most of them were a bunch of cowards. When I would see one of them alone, I could smell their fear. They would give a quick nervous high and avoid eye contact. Then when I saw them grouped up with their friends on the stairwell or on the train or just playing the curb, they acted powerful. In the group, they liked to bum rush and knock people over just for the fun of it. 
One schoolboy punk named Manny tried to intimidate me once with his crew. About 15 of them walked close behind me from the train station to my building. They would step up their pace, come up close on my heels, then bust out laughing. I knew they was waiting for me to turn around, so I didn't. Later on, when I caught Manny alone, I pushed my 22 into his ribs and he shit all over himself. I changed his name to Doodoo. He never tried that shit with me again. Now, every time I see a schoolboy crew, they act like they don't see me and just walk on by. Keeping everybody on edge was the robbery boys. They didn't go to school or work. They hung around waiting for everybody else to do that. Once the people were out of the building, they ran up and broke into their apartments and spots, stealing toasters, televisions, VCRs, and whatever they could sell. Their team was known as the Smash Brothers. It was led by two brothers. One was named Ronald, the other named Roland, last name Smash. This team of geniuses would steal from the fifth floor and sell the goods to the people living on the sixth floor. After one big smash and grab, they f***ed around and sold the girl from my building's new red leather jacket before she ever got a chance to rock it. When the girl from the next building over who bought the jacket from the Smash Brothers wore it outside, it tipped off Girl War One. A bunch of 14 and 15 year old chicks were out front beating the sh** out of each other. The real owner of the jacket and the new owner of the jacket were fighting for the coat they both paid for. The rest of them girls were fighting cause they lived in different buildings and were always beefing anyhow. The boys and a few men from both buildings cheered when the shirts got ripped open and the bras and panties started flying. The fight ended when a girl from the other building bit off the finger of a girl from my building. The cops who had been standing still watching the fight and enjoying the view swooped down on all of them. Ronald Smash located the bloody finger and handed it over to the police like he was an innocent bystander and a concerned youth. I didn't go to school. I study at home. Sometimes during the day, I let them robbery boys see my face around the building so they know if they come running up into my spot, they'll never get back out. Anyway, the Smash Brothers ain't half as bold as the stick-up kids. They don't wait till you go to work or school to steal your sh**. The cash crew rolls right up to your face. They'll let you see their faces too and still take your sh**. Matter of fact, everybody in the building knows who they are. They wave their guns around, bust shots in the air, or randomly shoot off rooftops. In a tight situation, they bust off at the popo. Terrorized youth and mothers bend to them. Old ladies gamble with their lives and dime them out to the cops, unaware that the officers they're calling for help are just as crooked as the crooks. The leader of the cash crew, named Mighty Dollar, Mighty for short, didn't deal with stolen toasters, televisions, VCRs, or furniture. His crew stole shit that was either cash or easy to liquidate into cash like jewels and welfare checks. Mighty was notorious for controlling the mailboxes in the lobby of our building where people received their checks, the coin boxes from the payphones, the parking meters, and for hitting up the local arcades. They was on the prowl every day, but I noticed they did their biggest capers on vacations and holidays. On Christmas Day, they went on a quote-unquote shopping spree. I know because my family doesn't celebrate Christmas. It is just another day for us. The cash crew caught a group of schoolboy suckers running their mouth and showing off their presents, styling and shining in their new gifts. Mighty made all of them run their valuables. They took their new jewels right off their necks and wrists and put it right onto theirs. Afterward, Mighty and his boys just chilled right there outside the building, sporting the stolen sh** and confident nobody could do anything about it. I was on the block when Leviticus came downstairs with his mama. 
She had a black extension cord in one hand, following behind her teenage son. She stood about twenty feet away as her son went to beg his watch back. The boy seemed so scared, his hands and legs were shaking, and his bottom lip had dried up and turned ashy gray. It was as if Mighty had eyes behind his head and saw Leviticus coming. He started laughing before the kid even got close on his back. Even his boys thought it was mad funny. The kid stood behind Mighty, mumbling about, Can I talk to you for a minute? Mighty stayed calm, kept conversating with his boys, and wouldn't bother to respond. I understood that. My father always said, Men don't mumble. Either shut the f*** up or speak the f*** up. Afraid and defeated, the boy walked back towards his mother, who spanked his ass with her black cord right outside in front of everybody. He jumped around like he was dancing on hot rocks. Afterward, his mother approached Mighty with part of the cord still wrapped around her hand and the heaviest part dangling. She started talking loud about how he better give her son back his watch. Mighty said, how do you know this is your son's watch? She answered, Cause it's a G-Shock, and I bought it for him, and it costs too much damn money to be played around with. Mighty said, You are right, it's a nice watch. That's why I bought it. He laughed. You didn't buy that one. I bought it. Take it off, and I'll prove it to you. She said with her free hand on her hip. If I take this watch off, you're gonna have to take something off too, Mighty warned her. Are your feet as pretty as your face? He asked the boy's mother. And in what had to be the worst day of the boy's life, his mother's whole stance switched. She cracked a wild smile of delight at Mighty's twisted compliment and answered, I do have nice feet. Mighty showed the mother the watch. She flipped it over and pointed out that she had Leviticus's name engraved on the back of it. And that ain't nobody else around here named Leviticus. Mighty gave her the watch. She gave Mighty herself. They became the rowdiest couple on the block, famous for fighting and f***ing indoors and outdoors. Mighty even shot at her once as she ran out the back of the building. The last time I seen Leviticus, we rode down in the elevator together. I handed him a flyer for the dojo, figuring he might want to start training his mind and his body. As a teenager, he would be starting out late in learning fighting techniques. Still, I couldn't see him surviving in the hood without a whole new outlook, understanding, and stance. We didn't speak no words that day in the elevator. In fact, I never even saw him on the block again, although his moms were still living there, disgracing herself. I had one run-in with Mighty and them. I saw their crew out in the dumps a place where garbage is piled up on top of garbage. They seem surprised to see me rolling for self out there where they be plotting at. They watched me as I set up empty cans for target practice. I stayed focused and started blasting the cans rapid fire quick, letting them see how I hit my target when I take aim the first time. Before the gun smoke cleared, I disappeared. They were tight that my firing caused the cops to come racing to their meetup spot. They had to switch up their hideout after that. Still, I knew they were impressed. They couldn't do that sh**. When they got into a shootout with this kid named Scooter around our way, I counted 20 or more bullets, led off by three different shooters. Shell casings dropped all over the sidewalk. They never hit nothing or nobody. Meanwhile, their live target is just running at top speed, dipping, zigzagging, slipping away from them easily. By watching Mighty and them, I learned that a small reckless crew of cats can rule over a whole building off of fear alone. They had guns, but no shooting skills. They had easy targets as their victims, but no goal. No plans other than dressing up, styling, and playing CeeLo outside the building with other people's money. Around our way, we got pimps and severe same thing. Stupid girls and desperate women are their prey, product, and cargo. Their business is steady and heavy. 
One day, you see a young Slimmy walk to the store with her butt poked out. A few nights later, you see her going in and out of the side entrance of a little hole-in-the-wall strip club called the Squeeze, all courtesy of Larry from Apartment 3B, the runner for the main pimp in our area named Trinidad. Larry lingers around the building with a pocket filled with Jolly Ranchers, now laters and blow pops. He got an eye for the extra young ones whose bodies are just starting to fill out. The ones who like to cut class lean on the wall when they walk, look lonely, and ain't got no fathers, brothers, or brains. Me and him bumped heads once when I went up on the rooftop to clear my mind, think, and watch. I call him conducting a lollipop licking contest between three little girls, ages maybe 10 or 11, 12 tops. The little girls were all eager faced. Their tongues dark grape, dark cherry, and dark watermelon. They were licking really fast and hard, really trying to beat each other to the promised prize, while dirty 30-something-year-old Larry watched with his long fingers and dirty long fingernails. I snapped, then cracked that motherfucker over the head with an empty Colt 45 40-ounce bottle. I told them little girls to go home as Larry folded and fell out cold like Thomas Hitman Hearns after Marvelous Marvin hit him with that right. Two of the little girls looked shocked. The other one started talking about, You messed up my prize money. Now you owe me five dollars. I told her, shut up and slow down. After that, I figured I was wasting my time trying to talk to her trying to defend an honor that none of them had based on an idea that none of them knew and a belief that none of them understood or shared. Later, Larry and his apprentice, a big 17-year-old named Lance, jumped me. I didn't use my burner. It wasn't on that level. Larry backed off when he felt how hard the blows were swinging. He wasn't no real fighter. He was only a conqueror of young girls. He said for me and Lance to shoot a fair one. I went straight to it. I was 13 years young. I caught more than a few bruises. I didn't care. I thought it was worth it. In my mind, pimps are lower than thieves. I don't know where Larry moved his stripper training camp to. I just knew it wasn't happening on the rooftop of my building no more. It was big news when Lance got arrested for molesting some little girl from the block who wasn't even old enough to strip at the illegal strip joint squeeze. Now them same three little girls who I looked out for on the rooftop be wandering around the hood giving me the eye as though they want to get with me and got something that I want. I brush them off, send them home, and remind them to stay off that roof and the stairs and out of everybody's face. I guess they just destined to be fast. I look at them as being exactly how I would never allow my little sister to be. I would rather my sister be dead than to turn out like one of them. In fact, someone would have to either call the coroner to haul off the guy who tried to get at my little sister or step over my dead body to get my little sister into that low, ran-through position. Every now and then, the young ones who ain't robbing and stealing or pimping get the bright idea to form themselves a gang. A few of them approached me to see if I wanted to get down with their team. I said, nah. Only some black American fools could stop and think and then come up with the idea that being in a gang means wearing the same colors, dressing up the same like a bunch of f***ing cheerleaders, beating each other down, and running wild scaring the s*** out of their own neighbors. These gang types were hilarious to me with their secret handshakes and bullshit nickel and dime schemes. Because they all dressed the same and did the same dumb s***. The cops could easily identify them and had an easy excuse to keep sweeping and locking them up. Every day, some of them got picked up and a handful got let out. They snitched on one another so much, there was no way for them to really know who was in or out of the gang at any given time. I felt sorry for the young gang fools. Some of them had heart, but none of them had brains. I figured someone ought to tell them little motherfuckers that America is a country of businesses. 
If they wanted to be able to buy anything in this country, they had to have something to sell, a product. And everything you eat, wear, do, or watch is a product you could be manufacturing and selling for the right price. But these boys were knuckleheads. Instead of getting a product or building up a skill or talent, they would turn around and sell their own sisters and mama. The way I looked at them was, if you don't have no real business, no real money, no real plan, no real power, why should I join you? Should we get together and split nothing nine ways? I mean, I come from a country where men fight over gold, oil, diamonds, and land. Now I live in a country where n fight over nothing. The drug dealers got something though. Cars and cash and a constant flow of f**ks. But individually and together, they seem like disorganized, gullible dudes. The real hustlers in Midtown Manhattan's Diamond and Gold District and the jewelers down on Canal Street always get excited when they see them coming. They take them for their money and they play them for fools. They get them dripping and draped in 10 karat gold, one, two, and four finger rings and cloudy diamonds. The hustlers who think they a cut above the rest insist on 14 or 18 karat gold. Where I'm from, even this kind of jewelry is known as junk. Around my way, at the time, the dealer's car of choice was the BMW. They also chilled in Maximas, Saabs, Jaguars, and Baby Benzes. The 190. Somehow, each of them would find some way to f*** up a decent new ride. Either they would put bright yellow fog lights on or skirts or add an additional bumper made of plastic or some big f***ing letters pasted on the windows, which I thought could only draw even more attention to themselves when it seemed to me like common sense that their line of work required them to hang back and camouflage. Around the hood... They be flossing their money knots, shaking their dice, shooting CeeLo, smoking weed, hugging 40s, making an unnecessary scene in the sunlight when everybody's watching. Any one of them would pull a stack of bills out, line a bunch of boys up, and pay for all of them to get cuts at the barber shop or ice cream at the ice cream truck. I turned down their office. There wasn't no real money in it for me. Besides, I have a father. I wasn't out looking for none of these cats to play daddy. All of their deals were loaded anyway. They got almost everything. You got next to nothing. The police stay on your ass, not the boss. They stay styling while you became nothing but a scrambler, a runner, you running all the risk all the time. One of them, known on the streets by the name Superior, offered me a package to sell for him with promises of me blowing up over time. I told him, nah, I had no time for that bullshit. Of course, there were working people where I lived who had regular jobs. Their work was legit, but their mentality was just as foreign to me. We had janitors, waiters, garbage men, and postal workers. They were grown men. They did what they thought they had to do on the weekdays and got high or drunk on the weekends to forget it all. They tricked part of their earnings watching and paying young girls to peel their clothes off at squeeze and pay them a little more to bounce in their laps. Compared to all the other men in the hood, they swore they were doing it. They had legit jobs with benefits and crowned themselves kings because of it. For entertainment, they juggled the hearts of the husbandless mothers who outnumbered them ten to one. Their constant lying and creeping made for tight, uncomfortable, volatile rides down on the elevator in the morning where those various women faced off. We also had a couple of shiny shoe U.S. Army cats living in our hood. They were shipped, deployed, and flown in and out. They were respected for their assumed military skills. On top of that, cats admired that they had permission and orders to kill without penalty. Envious young niggas got their get back on the military men by making trampolines out of their girlfriends and wives while they were away on active duty. One cat named Arthur f 
looked around and caught feelings from one of the army wives and blasted her husband on the first hour on his first day on leave back home. The army guy has survived the blood, roar, bullets, and bombs of America's unjust wars. He managed to stay alive in the alleys and corridors of Beirut, Lebanon, but got clapped up and gunned down easily on the ghetto-hot streets of PK. Luther Matthews was a big-time corrections officer who still lived in our building along with the same motherfuckers who kept getting locked up. He walked around like he was a super cop and a detect. The older females sweated him because he had a job, benefits, and a uniform. I looked at him like he couldn't be too smart, a grown sand man still stuck in the projects with the wild wolves. I once saw him behind the building beefing with some young strays like they was his own children. Quick-tempered, he started screaming, Wait till I get your asses up in Rikers! Like he was so sure every teen would end up in lockup eventually. The real cops were like germs no antibiotic could kill. They watched us. We watched them. They were all over the place. So were we. The only difference was we lived there and they didn't. Still, they acted like they lived there and we didn't. They had beef with everybody who wasn't one of their bitches or snitches. No matter what a guy's angle is, legit or illegit, around my way, you're gonna encounter the police. There are random stops, random searches, random beatdowns, random arrests, random police shootings and murders of unarmed teams, and none of it random. So I move calm, yet swift through the streets, and I got more than a few hidden places to stash my heat. The notorious cop around our way was Officer Brandon Huff. Black and built like a bodybuilder. He was known for pulling over pretty young things on a routine survey and head count of single mothers. He would entice them with his promises to straighten out their teenage sons who wouldn't act right, quote unquote, or respect them. He was big on beatdowns and more prejudiced against black youth than a white man. Everybody around my way called Officer Huff by a street name. Stress. I like math, and I am good and quick with numbers. I figured out the small percentage of time I spent in the hot spot known as my block, the less of a chance of me getting harassed and bagged by the cops for standing still. I avoided my block, treated it like one big walkthrough. I was looking for something or someplace entirely different. I set up my adventures elsewhere. But since everybody else, including the heroin fiends, stood on the block every day in the same spot, doing the same things, it was impossible for them not to notice me moving around. Over time, people thought they knew me. The streets stay watching. But I didn't take none of them for friends or acquaintances or bless them with any kind of real conversation. From time to time, it would just be one of them doing the telling and me doing the listening and nodding. I had to keep track of the happenings one way or another as a form of defense of my fam. It was only Daquan who kept coming for me, trying to pull me into the fold of his f***ed up quote-unquote community. He kept track of all the boys on the block, made them fight s*** out, even hung a punching bag on a chain from the lampposts. He set up races and games, gave kids new names based on how they battled and competed and where they fit in because everything for him was about muscle, strength, competition, and dominance. He believed in each one, teach one. He was a supplier. That's how I saw him. I knew for now I needed him to re-up on bullets. Plus, you never know. So I cooperated with him from time to time. I saw he took a liking to me, maybe because he bet on me a few times and won. As far as I was concerned, I was at war with every boy, every teen, every man living or working on my block. I was either at war with them, with my mind, my ideas and my beliefs, or my fists, my feet, and my weapons. I was sure about one thing. Our hoods were f***ed up. Nobody could think or live straight. Everybody everywhere got guns cocked and loaded and 1,000 reasons to shoot. I got my guns too. I don't love them, but I need them.
I hate to do this right now, but we gotta take a pause for the cause because I need y'all to tune in to the next edition of Ralph Reads. Meanwhile, I would like, or rather love, to thank you, queens and kings, fellow royalty, for stopping by. You may connect with me via Facebook, send a friend request while you still can, to Ralph Anthony Garcia, and on Twitter and Instagram, at RGMC2407. Send an email to RGMC2407 at gmail.com, where if you would like to leave a small donation, please use the Zelle app, or paypal.me forward slash RGMC2407, or cash app. My cash tag is RGMC2407. You may also connect with me via my other channel, RGMC, Ralph Garcia, Master of Ceremonies, and right here on TURN. Tell a friend to tell a friend to tune in to the United Ronin Networks. We are Ronin. Fellow royalty, pick up a good book, read a good story, and set your good self free. I appreciate you, and I love you like cooked food. I will see you folks on the continuation of this Sister Soldier miniseries on Ralph Reed's. Take care, folks. Don't do nothing I wouldn't do.